Gracious God, we do thank you that as we uh, look at this portion of the Bible, we thank you that you are present with us by your Spirit. So we do pray and ask that as we look at the Scriptures today, that by your Spirit, you might just not just help us understand this portion of Scripture, but that you might actually bring it to bear on our hearts. We often <clears throat> read the Bible and we see others in the storyline. We don't often see ourselves in the storyline. Uh, so help us, Father, first apply these to our lives before we apply it in the lives of others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> One of the great myths when it comes to Christianity is that there are good guys and there are bad guys, or that Christianity is for people who are good, or that the Bible teaches that only good people get saved, or that the teaching of the Bible is how you can be good to be saved. It's a myth. Uh, that's one of the great myths in our culture today when it comes to Christianity, that there are good guys and bad guys and only good guys get saved. Now, Paul comes along uh, in the letter to the Romans, and what he does in this whole book is he shatters the myth that there is ever such a thing as a good guy. There are no good guys in God's economy. Everyone needs saving because everyone is broken, everyone is failed, everyone is guilty, everyone is bankrupt. Now, this is what's going to happen, right? Chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to chapter 3, <clears throat> is all about that. It's all about why there are no good guys in God's economy. Now, last week, we looked at those who live as they sexually please. You do you, I do me in the area of sexuality. Uh, we looked at those who live uh, as they morally please. You do you, I do me in the area of morality. But this week, when we come to chapter 2, Paul now says... Even people who think they are morally good people, who live as morally good people, actually need saving. Even the religious law-keeping who do good works, they too need saving. Now, that's what we're going to see from chapter 2 uh, onwards. Uh, Paul's conclusion will be, and it's there in your sermon outline, I've given you the summary so that by the time we get to the end of chapter 3, uh, after the next four weeks, really, over the month of May, uh, the conclusion will be very, very clear. There is no such thing as a good guy in God's economy. Uh, chapter 3, verse 9, Jew and Gentile are both under the power of sin. Chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. That is, the religious and the irreligious all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's Paul's conclusion. There are no good guys in God's economy. And if there are no good guys in God's economy, it means everyone needs saving. Jew and Gentile, uh, religious and irreligious, uh, the moral, the immoral, the conservative, the liberal, which is why the, the whole book of Romans is all about the good news, the good news of the power of God to save in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 16 and 17, we'll keep coming back to that uh, again and again. The gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Now, we come to chapter 2. I mean, last week, uh, we looked at the bad guys who live sexually as they please, morally as they please, you do you, I do me in the area of sexuality, morality. Now we look at verse 1 to verse 11 of chapter 2, uh, and, and you've got a group of religious people. Paul says this group of religious people need saving because they are bad guys who think they're good guys. Okay, so verse 1 to verse 11, bad guys who think they're good guys. Now next week, Warren is going to preach, uh, and Warren is going to look at bad guys who live like good guys who need saving. Okay, so this week, uh, you've got a, a bunch of bad guys who think they're good guys. Next week, you're going to meet a bunch of bad guys who live like good guys who think they need, the, who, who, who need saving, who don't think they need saving, but actually need saving. But this week, for the time being, we're just going to look at this group of people, a bunch of bad guys who think they're good guys. Okay? Uh, and in your outline, you notice there's three, out, three headings over there. We're going to look at it under three headings. Uh, the danger of passing judgment on others, the consequence of passing judgment on others, and the way God's righteous judgment actually works. Okay, so uh, have a look in your Bibles with me, chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 3, because verse 1 and verse 3 actually starts by telling us who Paul is talking about. Can you see there in verse 1 and verse 3? Twice he says, you judge others by a standard that you yourself do not keep or live by. You see there? You therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you think you who do, who pass judgment, notice, do the same things. 
Verse 3, so when you, a mere human, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? So who exactly is Paul talking about? Uh, who's he actually talking to? Uh, what sort of person is this? Uh, I think it's someone who's highly moralistic uh, in the way they relate to others, uh, someone who has a high moral standard by which they judge others, someone who's quite a religious person, I suspect, which is why one possibility is Paul is speaking to the religious Jew, but he could also be speaking uh, to, the, to the religious Gentile, okay? the non-Jew, the non-Greek, the Greek. Uh, and so what we do know is that whoever he has in mind isn't just someone who is highly moralistic, uh, highly religious, isn't just someone who has higher moral demands and standards of others. They also, notice, they make moral demands of others, but never of themselves. They expect of others what they will not expect of themselves. That's the kind of people we're talking about. They judge others by what they do, but while doing the very same things and excusing themselves. Uh, but they are religious sort of people. This is the religious person who judges others, but is guilty of the same things they judge others for. This is the religious person who thinks that they are generally a good guy, and because they're generally a good guy, God will overlook, or He'll turn a blind eye, or He'll ignore their sin, their shortfalls, their shortcomings in life. God will somehow overlook or turn a blind eye to the very things they judge others for in their own lives. Uh, they think God will somehow give them special treatment or excuse their sin or the sin they condemn in others. Paul says, verse 3, notice, when you pass judgment on others and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape <coughs> God's judgment? And, and so, chapter 2, verse 1 to 11, really is Paul's warning to people who hold the high moral ground in life, who judge others yet do the very same things in their lives, um, thinking that somehow, you know, God, has, God will give them a get-out-of-jail card for the things they do in life. Now, the Bible has a word for this kind of behavior, right? It does. You are well familiar of this, with this, right? The Bible has a word for this kind of behavior. It's called hypocrisy. And whether you are a Christian or not a Christian, religious or secular, we all know everyone is put off by hypocrisy. We know what it looks like. You don't have to be a religious person to know what hypocrisy looks like. Politicians who publicly condemn others for not upholding family values who then abandon their family and their marriages. Well, that's called hypocrisy. Politicians who publicly, publicly condemn the way other governments treat refugees only to put in place very brutal and oppressive refugee policies. That's called hypocrisy. Uh, managers in the workplace, some of you will have experienced this, who will condemn others for acting in very manipulative ways, but whose own pattern is to gaslight others under them. That's called hypocrisy. You know what it looks like. Paul says, verse 3, when you pass judgment on others and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Now, I don't know if you realize this. If you and I are really honest with ourselves, we tend to be much more critical of others than we are of ourselves, aren't we? In fact, we tend to hold other people around us to a much higher standard than we do ourselves. We tend to be harsher on others than we are on ourselves. In fact, sometimes you can work yourself up into such a state of self-righteous anger at the behavior of others, while the same behavior in our lives we often gloss over. We can be very smug when we condemn others for the very things we sort of gloss over in our lives. You and I are just as prone to hypocrisy. In fact, Jesus warns us in a passage that's very familiar to you, uh, whether you are a Christian or not, because, you know, you hear people use this sort of phrase in culture. You know, in culture, people say, hey, you know, uh, stop, stop, taking, stop picking at the speck in other people's eyes and take out the log out of your own eyes. Well, Jesus said that, right? Luke chapter 6, verse 41, Jesus says, when you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye when you fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Take the plank out of your own eye first. You see, and, and so it's far easier for us to judge others for something they have done while ignoring not just the same things, but the far worse things we do in our own lives. It's true, isn't it? Now, why would someone do that? 
there are some reasons why someone might think that God's judgment operates differently from person to person. Uh, some people think that they're exempt from God's judgment because they are more religious than other people. Okay? I think religious people tend to think like that. So when I sin, my sin isn't as bad because I'm a religious person, I'm a church-going person, I'm generally a good person. So God is much more understanding. But when a bad guy sins, whoa, God judges. Now, some people do think like that. The religious Jews certainly thought like that because the Jews thought they were God's special people. And, and they were God's special people. That's the story of the Old Testament, right? Uh, they were God's special people. But it didn't mean that God had a different standard of judgment on them. Notice verse 2. God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. It's not based on race or culture or works or tradition. Now, another reason why someone might think that they're exempt from God's judgment is simply because, you know, when they look at the people around them, uh, they're simply not as bad as other people. That was the problem with the religious leaders in Jesus' day. Uh, the, the religious in Jesus' day always focus on the externals. And then you meet Jesus, and Jesus drives much deeper, doesn't he? Uh, it's easy to think you're not that bad when you look at other people. Look at what others are doing in my workplace. I don't do that. Uh, look at my classmates and how they're treating others at school. I don't do that. Really? Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, verse 20. Jesus said, it's the things that come out of a, pers the, the things that come out of a person's mouth comes from the heart. And these defile them. See, what defiles people? Well, it's not just the things that come out. It's actually what's inside the heart. And then he says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. This is what makes you unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. If you judge by the externals, more often than not, you will always come up in front especially if you're a moral person, uh, you always find that you're externally blameless because you are not like them in the way you live your life. Until you start to actually dig beneath the surface of your heart, that's when you realize that you're not a good guy. You're actually one of the bad guys who thinks you're a good guy. That only happens when you look at the heart. Uh, author Ray Stedman uh, writes, there's a little quote there for you uh, that you can look at. He writes, the first insight into the mind of self-righteous moralizers is that they do not understand the nature and extent, the extent really of sin. They imagine that because they have not actually committed one of the principal sins, they are beyond judgment. Well, I haven't done any of the major stuff. The truth is they may not have overtly committed adultery or rape, but it has happened in their minds. It's called lust. They did not overtly steal, but their minds have robbed even their loved ones. They have not overtly committed murder, but numerous times the mental knife has plunged itself into the one they so despise. And then he writes, God sees all this. He is not deceived in, by our indulging in self-righteous delusion by renaming our personal sins. Others lie and cheat. We simply stretch the truth. Others betray, we're protecting our rights. Others steal, oh, we borrow. Others are prejudiced, we have convictions. Notice that you can judge others and yet do the very same things. In your heart and in your mind. And so Paul says, verse 3, when you pass judgment on others yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? And so Paul's warning here is that when you religious people judge others and condemn others for the very things you do in your life, you're condemning yourself. And so God does not operate on some double standard, one for others and one for me, just because I'm more religious. Just because I go to church, just because I give to support justice and mercy, just because I don't get smashed on a Friday night, no, God will base His judgment on truth for the religious and the irreligious, the moral and the immoral, right? The conservative and the liberal, God does not have double standards. Very important to keep that in mind. In fact, 
Paul's warning isn't just that you won't escape God's judgment. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 4. Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness to you uh, is, is intended to lead you to repentance, uh, to live your life on this path, to presume that God will excuse you for the very things you judge others for, to think that your good works or your ministry or the things you do, religious things you do, gives you a license to sin or excuses your behavior, to think that you're above judgment because your good works makes up for it. Notice what it's called. It's called contempt. Contempt. Basically, it's to treat God's kindness like trash. It's to treat His forbearance, that is, uh, His restraining judgment on your life, uh, His patience on you uh, with contempt. It is to spit in the face of God's kindness. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but hypocrisy in the Christian life is actually an act of defiance. It's actually an act of rebellion. Uh, especially when I'm prone to, con- to condemning the speck in the lives of others, yet actually ignoring the log or the plank uh, in my own life. Now, maybe, just maybe, maybe this passage is wanting us to pause the very next time we take the high moral ground with people around us. Maybe, just maybe, this passage is wanting me to pause to look at my own life as I think of everything that's wrong with other people's lives, which is what we tend to do. And maybe, just maybe this passage is wanting me to recognize that, you know, I am prone to condemn things in others when I too have things in my life that I should be condemning. Things that actually I need to repent of because I'm actually not a good guy. Uh, It's easy to point the finger at others, isn't it? Just remember you know, mom and dad have probably told you this. Don't point. Why? Because there's three fingers pointing back at you. Okay? It's true, isn't it? Uh, your disapproval of sin and ungodliness in other people's lives does not excuse the sin and ungodliness in your own life. God will judge them, but He will also judge us. Uh, and so when you see the sin in others, it's not an opportunity to be self-righteous. It's not your chance to play God, right? Right? Uh, It's an opportunity for you and I to actually repent, to look at our own lives. Sometimes, I don't know whether you realize this, the grace of God actually comes to us in the sin of others. Do you know that? Sometimes the grace of God comes to us in the sin of others because it's meant to make us realize that we are not too different to them. We too are under the judgment of God for our sins. Uh, It's meant to make us realize that God has been gracious, He's been kind, He's holding back judgment, He's being patient with me because what is God doing? He's giving me an opportunity to repent. Isn't that amazing? Even in my hypocrisy, even when I'm acting in a self-righteous way, even when I'm pointing the finger at others, God is giving me an opportunity to repent. And the twin warnings is that you will not escape judgment if you keep doing this, and to continue doing this is an act of contempt to treat the kindness of God in your life with contempt. Now, uh, the consequences now come in verse 5 and verse 6. So in your Bibles, look at verse 5 and verse 6, because Paul says, look, if you keep going down this path, you're only storing up wrath for yourself on the coming day of judgment. Okay? So verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant hearts, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when His righteous judgment will be revealed. And then it says, God will repay each person according to what they have done. So now there are consequences, aren't they, uh, for passing judgment on others while ignoring your own sins. Okay? Notice how verse 5 and verse 6 works. To remain in your stubborn and unrepentant hearts leads to the storing up of God's wrath. Hypocrisy actually leads to the storing up of God's wrath. Ignoring the same sins in your life that you condemn in others is storing up God's wrath. Staying in a state of unrepentance, treating God's kindness with contempt, leads to the storing up of God's wrath. And so notice what Paul says. He says, a day will come when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God will then repay each person according to what they have done. Now, what's he talking about? He's actually talking about a day of judgment, a day when God's justice, God's wrath is poured out, a day of accounting, a day of reckoning. Um, And and that idea of final judgment, 
a day of accountability is not something that the vast majority of people believe in secular culture. I mean, these days, right, uh, in your workplaces, uh, you speak of coming judgment, and people actually put you in the fundamentalist camp. Uh, they, asso they associate you, you know, with the, uh, the caricatures you see of the street preacher who stands on the corner with a billboard that says judgment is coming. Okay? That's if you speak of coming judgment. But this is what I find really uh, fascinating about secular culture. We reject the notion that there is such a thing as a final judgment, a day of accounting, a day of reckoning, but we all want justice. It's true, isn't it? We all want justice. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, religious or irreligious, you want justice. We want justice. We might not believe there'll be a day when justice will come for all, but we want it. We can certainly imagine it, a day when evil is made to account, uh, when the oppressor is punished, when wickedness is removed, when wrongs are made right, when those who have escaped justice are brought to justice. We can certainly imagine that. We desire that. And, and I remember saying in February, I don't know whether you guys remember it, but in February, you know, we're doing the series on the creed. I remember saying religious or irreligious, Christian or secular, there's no one I know who doesn't recognize that the world is a broken place. So you don't even have to be religious to recognize the world is a broken place. We see people exploited. We see wicked people escape judgment. Everyone wants a better world. And even if you're not a Christian, you can imagine a better world where pain and suffering doesn't exist, a world, a world where the tears of loss and grief are no more, a world where there's perfect justice and lasting peace, where a world where the person who has escaped justice is called to account. You can imagine that. And it cannot happen unless, unless evil is dealt with, unless wickedness is completely dealt with, unless every wrong is made right, unless what is lost is given back to you. And it can't happen unless there is a final judgment. It's that longing that's echoed in the stories of every culture, religious or irreligious. You cannot save the world without removing evil completely. You cannot have a better world without removing evil forever. You cannot have justice unless the wicked are punished. You cannot have justice without a final judgment. And so the solution, right? Many of you will know the story. I know Nate and M just came back and they, were, they saw, I think, the Harry Potter play or something. But, you know, in Harry Potter, right, the solution is not to, like, tolerate Voldemort. No, there needs to be a final judgment. There needs to be justice. The solution in the Marvel Universe was not to tolerate Thanos. No, there needs to be a solution. And even in the Lord of the Rings, right, the solution was not to tolerate Sauron. And so here's the thing, right? If you've been abused or wrong, the solution is not to tolerate abuse and the injustice you've experienced. No, you can only have a better world that's only complete healing when every evil and wickedness and wrong is called to account and then removed when there is final judgment carried out against every evil and wickedness. Now, Christian people actually believe that there is such a day. Look at verse 5 and verse 6. A day will come when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. And so, you might have friends who are not Christians. You might not even be a Christian here today. Even if you're not someone who believes in God, you may not believe in God. The longing in your heart for ultimate justice cannot be denied. You may not believe there's a, such a, a thing as a final judgment, but every heart actually longs for it. A day of judgment would be good news, welcome news, because it means evil and wickedness will never win. It means those who have perpetrated abuse and got away with it, well, they're going to be punished, called to account. It means there will be justice for all who have been exploited in their lives. It means that the travesties of injustice will be reversed. It means that wrongs will be made right. That's what verse 5 and verse 6 is saying, right? A day will come when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Now, maybe you have friends, or maybe you, have, you don't believe in a final judgment. No such thing as a final judgment to come. Well, consider the alternative. What if there was no final judgment to come? Well, consider the alternative. Living in a world where there is no final accounting or reckoning required, where there will be no future judgment offered. 
Well, one author I read put it like this, it's there in your outlines, it would be a world in which the cries of the oppressed and the crimes of the oppressor are both ignored. That's what it would be like. An arc of history that bends towards oblivion and unaccountability, not justice. Such a view of the world will leave the meaning tank permanently empty. We will be the escaped fish of Finding Nemo, floating on a sea of freedom, asking, what now? What now for those of us suffering at the hands of wickedness and evil? What now for those of us who've been abused, whose abusers have got away with it? What now for those of us who have been exploited and have never got justice? If the secular is right, then at the end, there is nothing. No justice, no calling to account, no reversal, only a deafening silence. It means this life belongs to the strong, not the weak. It belongs to the powerful, not the poor. The oppressor, not the oppressed. The abuser, not the abuse. Can I say to you, if there's no future judgment, no calling to account, no fixing what's wrong with our lives and our world, then there's no hope for those on the receiving end of suffering at the hands of the wicked. No hope for those who've been exploited and abused at the hands of the wicked. If there is no day of judgment, it means injustice wins. The oppressor wins. The perpetrator of injustice wins. But in our heart of hearts, whether we are Christian or not, religious or secular, in our heart of hearts, everyone longs for a happily ever after. We want wrong to be made right. We want evil to be made accountable. We want wickedness punished. We want a day of justice. And the good news we read, a day will come when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. Now, that's good news, but you know what? It's also bad news, isn't it, if you think about it? It's also bad news because it means His righteous judgment will, will be revealed in my life and your life. It means His righteous judgment will be revealed against the evil and wickedness in your life and my life. It means God will also repay you and I according to what we have done, right? And so Paul's saying, hey, you religious people, right, who condemn others for their sin while ignoring your sin, the same sin you condemn others for, if you go down this path, you will experience God's judgment. That's justice for all. That's God being fair. Paul says, hey, you hypocrites, right, who stand in judgment uh, over others, condemning others while excusing your own sin, you'll experience God's judgment. That's justice for all. That's God actually being fair. Now, let me make it very clear. Paul is not saying that you are saved by your good works. It's very important to understand that. He's not saying you're saved by your good works or that you can somehow escape final judgment by being a more moral person. That's not what he's saying. He's told us what God wants. What does God want? Verse 4, verse 5. Can you see there? What does God want? God wants repentance. Verse 5, it's an unwillingness to repent that brings judgment. Uh, the way of salvation in the Bible and here is never good works. Paul is not saying God is going to repay you for what you have done on the day of judgment, so you make sure you start doing more good works in life. Paul's not saying that. Salvation is always by way of repentance and faith in God's power to save. Repentance says, I'm not a good guy. I need saving from my hypocrisy, my judgmental spirit, my self-righteous pride, and in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17, Paul tells us that the good news is the power of God to save in Jesus, that you receive by faith, by trusting His work for you. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died for your hypocrisy, your judgmental spirit, your self-righteous pride. He was judged in your place and condemned in your place. He took on Himself the consequences of your sin. He was judged in your place. But, but your works in life, the way you live your life, actually gives evidence to your faith on the day of judgment. Uh, a public judgment requires a public verdict, and a public verdict will require evidence to support that sentence or that judgment. And so the public evidence will always be your works. 
what you have done, how you have lived, how you have used the gifts God has given you, how you treated others. And so the, the presence or absence of saving faith or faith in Jesus is always going to be disclosed by the presence or absence of works in your life, in our lives. Uh, you could say the presence or absence of faith in, tr- in Jesus, trust in Jesus, will be disclosed by the presence or absence of hypocrisy, judgmentalism, and self-righteous pride in our lives. Remember what James chapter 2, verse 18 says? James says, chapter 2, verse 18, I will show you my faith by my works. Right? And so the presence and absence of certain works reveals what kind of faith I have in my life. And that will be uncovered on the day of final judgment. And so it's no surprise. Have a look at verse 7 to verse 11. Paul now tells us how God's righteous judgment actually works. This is how it works. Okay, verse 7 to verse 11. I want you to notice there are two possible endings, two possible conclusions. Verse 7, eternal life. And that depends on what you seek in life. And then the second conclusion, possible conclusion, the wrath and anger. Notice verse 8, the outpouring of God's judgment, which also depends on what one seeks in life. And so notice in God's economy, the way God works, judgment means two possible conclusions in someone's life. Now, that is not an unusual thing. You know, people get so upset when we speak of the judgment of God that, you know, some are sentenced and condemned, others are not. And people get upset about that, but it happens all the time, every day in our courts of law, doesn't it? That, that's, that's how justice works. When you stand before a judge, there can only be two verdicts, right or wrong, guilty or innocent, in the wrong or in the right, sentence or set free. And so, so there can be no justice without a verdict. That's, that's how justice works. So it's fair to assume that if there is a final judgment and God is going to repay each person according to what they have done, then there has got to be a verdict and two possible outcomes. And here I want you to notice there are only two ways to live in God's economy that lead to two different conclusions at the end. Now, we saw in Romans chapter 1, didn't we? So if you go back to Romans chapter 1, we're not looking at it today. I'll give you a quick summary. We saw in Romans chapter 1 that if there is a God who is creator to whom you owe your life, then there's nothing that you have that you do not owe to Him, which means, Paul says, you should live your life glorifying Him and giving Him thanks. Uh, if there is a God, he says, who, has, who is a powerful creator, who's got a design and purpose for your life, for the flourishing of your life because he's your creator, it means you should embrace his rule, his way. You should seek, basically, uh, an understanding of his purposes and design for your life so that you will flourish. You could do that, he says. But it also means that you could choose not to. You could choose not to do that too, There is another alternative, isn't there? You could choose not to glorify Him, not to give Him thanks. You could choose to live for yourself and go your own way in life. You could choose to decide for yourself what's right and wrong, what you believe to be right and wrong. And so, those are the two ways Paul highlights in verse 7 and verse 8. Right? That's what he's saying in verse 7 and verse 8. There's two ways to those, notice verse 7, who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. See that? Now, I don't know if you realize this. If there was a God, it means there are only two ways to live in the world. You are either going to live seeking His glory or you seek your own glory in life. You either seek His honor, His approval, or you live for the honor and approval of another in life. You, you either embrace the truth about Him or you reject the truth about Him. You either seek what is lasting, that is immortality, or you live for what is never going to last, the created things. You either live His way, or you live as you please, following after whatever you deem to be right or wrong in life. And so the righteous judgment of God hinges on who you have surrendered your life to in life. And it's seen in how you live your life, what you seek. And that's the reason why you cannot separate faith and works. Trust and works. Works never saves, but it is the evidence of faith. Notice what Paul says about how God will execute His righteous judgment. Look at verse 7 and 8 with me again. 
to those who by persistence in doing good seek God. But for those who are who will not seek God and follow evil, notice, living as they please, there will be wrath and anger. Can I say to you, whether you're a Christian or not, or whether your friends are Christians or not, because, you know, can I say that this actually has implications on the way you live your life, Christian or not a Christian? Because if there was no accounting, no righteous judgment at the end, then it doesn't matter how you live your life, does it? Whose praise you live for, whose glory you seek, it doesn't matter. Uh, what path you go down, good or evil, whether you're sexually or morally free to do what you want, it doesn't matter because it matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll because there is no punishment. I'm captain of my fate and I'm truly master of my soul. But then you've got to take a step back, isn't it? What if there was a God? If there was a God, if there was a righteous judgment, then it matters how I live my life. Whose praise I live for matters, whose glory I seek matters, whose way directs my who whose way and directs my life matters, what choices I make matters, right and wrong matter, because there will be a day of accounting. And so if you are a Christian, you need to really understand that and not presume that there will not be a judgment. The righteous judgment of God hinges on who you have surrendered to in life, and it's seen in how you will live your life. And God's righteous judgment will reveal that. Two possible outcomes, two possible verdicts. And so, Paul's conclusion, verse 11, God shows no favoritism. God shows no favoritism. Let me draw three points of application for us this morning. So, you've got it there in your outline as well. Uh, Let me actually do that for us. Three points of possible uh, applications to think about. The first thing I want to say is that the desire for justice is a great thing. It's a good thing, a right thing. But even as you demand and seek justice, when you see injustice in the world or in the lives of the people around you, remember that God plays no favorites. In wanting justice, remember that God also demands justice of you in your relationship with Him and how you've lived your life. It's expressed in your life. Uh, You can't want God to do what is right right? To, to, to correct what's wrong in the world, to punish wickedness and evil, to bring retribution on those who hurt others without God also dealing with what's wrong with you. Your wickedness and evil, the hurt you cause others, your hypocrisy, your judgmental spirit, your self-righteous pride, there is, there is no double standard in God's economy, right? It's not like He's got a different set of rules and scare, uh, you know, a different set of rules for those of us in here, just because you're religious, and a different set of rules for people on the outside. No, no, no. His judgment notice is based on truth. If you want justice, then remember that God also demands justice of you. His righteous judgment means that He will repay each person according to what they have done. God plays no favorites. The desire for justice is a good thing, but it also means that you and I will also be judged. That's number one. Number two, beware the sin of hypocrisy, a judgmental spirit, and self-righteous pride. Beware. You know, if there's ever a prevalent sin in the Bible that you see time and time again, it would actually be the sin of presuming on God's grace and kindness, that you can judge others for their sin and ungodliness, yet remain yourself in this willful state of rebellion and sin and ungodliness. That was the problem with Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, The same warning is there in the New Testament as well, in in the epistles. Uh, uh, I think of the story of David in the Old Testament. Remember King David who stole another man's wife, who thought that because, you know, he was special, God's anointed, he was above judgment. And then the prophet Nathan comes to him. And the prophet Nathan says to David, hey, bit of a problem, and he tells him uh, about a rich man who has many flocks and herds and a poor man, right, who has only one ewe lamb that he's loved and raised and taken care of, and how the rich man seizes the poor man's one single lamb, precious to him, slaughters it for a meal rather than take from his own flock. And so the prophet Nathan tells, you know, David that story right? Something's happening, David, you know, in the city. I'm bringing this account to you. And in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're told that David, when he heard this, the text says, 
he burned with anger. He burned with, he was furious at the injustice. And then he said, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. You see that? And Nathan says, you are that man. You are that man. That's the problem with hypocrisy, isn't it? You think you are somehow held to a different moral standard because you're generally a good guy. David thought that, right? Because he was God's chosen. Jesus warns us about hypocrisy, doesn't he? Picking, notice he says, picking at the speck, the dirt basically, in someone's eye, and missing the plank. I think the actual translation is missing the log, the tree trunk in your own eye. And Jesus is being funny, right? And Paul here warns us about treating our sins lightly as believers, condemning others while persisting in the same sins in our lives, the ungodliness in our lives. You know, I remember hearing the ancient parable. You know, some of you heard this, you know, the two monks who are crossing the river, right? They, they are walking in silence when they see a very attractive, beautiful woman trying to cross the same river with a strong current. She's afraid, and she asks if one of them could help her cross. The two monks, they look at each other because they have taken a vow of, of not actually touching a woman, and without a word, the older monk picks her up, carries her across through the dangerous current, sets her on the other side. And then the two monks, they continue on their journey. They walk in silence for hours. And finally, the young monk, he breaks his silence and he says, you shouldn't have done that because monks are not supposed to even touch a woman. The older monk looks at him and says, brother, are you still carrying that woman? Because I put her down hours ago. It's a reminder to us that sin is not always visible. Because most of your sin and my sin, because I, I think, you know, we're a room of religious people, most of your sin and my sin takes place in here. And in here. Because it's, it's so easy to point out someone's sin, to judge someone else's lack of godliness, to think that I'm not like them at all, until you begin to look deeper. That's why one of the prayers of confession, right, we, we need to learn to pray. It was up there on the screen. One of the prayers of confession you should learn to pray is, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, notice, in thought and word and deed. In thought, in heart and word and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. That, those are the kinds of prayers we need to learn to pray. And so beware the sin of hypocrisy, a judgmental spirit, and self-righteous pride. That's number two. Here's the third one. Learn to approach the sin of others as a fellow sinner in need of grace and mercy, right? The Bible doesn't say, look, you know, the Bible doesn't say don't rebuke, don't challenge, don't correct. It doesn't say that. But the passage challenges us to consider how we engage and respond to the sin and the ungodliness of others without judgment. How to respond to the sins of our culture, our politicians, without judgment. How to respond to others who fail to meet our expectations, who disappoint us, who grieve us, who hurt us, who behave sometimes in wicked ways. We're called to always respond from a posture of humility. Hear that? Recognizing that we too have failed, we too have sinned. Christian people must never respond to the sin of others from a position of superiority but always from a position of grace. Never from a position of, I'm a better guy than you are. The gospel might say, you are not good. The gospel might say, you deserve God's judgment. But the gospel also says, I am just like you, right? I'm not a good guy. I too deserve God's judgment. Both of us equally need saving. That's a posture of humility. That's a posture of grace. You know, that's the Bible reading, the second Bible reading Daniel read for us. You know, the story of Jesus tells, the story of two guys who approach God in prayer, Luke chapter 18. And in the story Jesus tells, you have displayed for us the posture or the attitude of two different people, two different men who approach God. You've got the self-righteous Pharisee, he's the religious guy. Uh, and in that passage, notice he stands apart, he's looking down on others. He looked down on others. He judged by the external, never the heart. And he truly believed he was a good guy. And I really think he was a good guy. 
He meant every word he prayed, and it was probably true. He was not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers in life. His life was filled with good works, fasting twice a week, giving to meet the needs of the poor. He was not like the tax collector. And so what happens is the first guy, he stands on his morality, right? His, his righteousness, as it were, before God. And then he judged others by his morality, And he certainly didn't think he needed saving because he didn't think he was under any judgment. He really believed he was a good guy who didn't need saving because he compared himself to others. And when you compare yourself to others, you will always come up on the top. But you notice the tax collector, he stands, we read, at a distance. He he won't come close. He doesn't even think he's deserving. He's physically filled with remorse. And his prayer is so simple, isn't it? His prayer, God have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He knew and he saw himself as a bad guy in need of saving. He needed saving. And Jesus actually says, as Jesus tells this story, Jesus actually says, out of the, out of the two, only one went home justified. Only one went home right with God. Who do you think it was? The good guy who looked down on everyone else because he was morally better, who didn't think he needed saving, who didn't think he was deserving of judgment, Or the bad guy who looked at his life and saw that he needed saving, who saw he was under judgment, who saw he needed mercy. You see, when you see the sin of others, when you are confronted by the ungodliness of other people, the wickedness and evil of others, the right posture is never pride, never self-righteousness, never to compare how good you are compared to them. No, the right posture is actually the the right posture is to mourn over your own sinfulness, to mourn over your own wickedness, to mourn over your own evil, your immorality, your ungodliness, to cry out, I need saving. God have mercy on me, a sinner. See, it wasn't the one who was religious, who was right with God. It was the one who recognized they needed God's mercy. That's why I keep saying, you know, week after week, we keep repeating this because it's so important even for Christian people to hear. In Christianity, salvation comes not by being good, but by recognizing you are not good, that you're a bad guy, that you need God's mercy, that you need Him to save you, right? Salvation does not come by being good. In religion, salvation comes by being good. In fact, in religion, it depends on you not just being good. In religion, right? In religion, salvation depends on you being better than everyone else. That's how religion works. Salvation is not for everyone. But in Christianity, salvation is for everyone who believes, who trusts in Jesus' work for them, irrespective of their good works or their morality or their law-keeping. Salvation comes by throwing yourself on the mercy of God. God, I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. Have mercy on me. Save me. And God saves in the Lord Jesus. Uh, one of the prayers I constantly pray, every time I go for a walk, or whenever I have a quiet moment, you know, I'll go down the road to grab a coffee in, the, uh, you know, in, in between meetings in the office, or when I go for a walk in general, when I, I have a quiet moment in the house, I always try to remind myself of my many scenes and my need for mercy, uh, which, which is a reminder to me that others need mercy as well. And so this is a prayer I pray constantly through the day. I constantly pray through the day, whenever there is a gap, I constantly pray, Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on me. Jesus, bearer of my sins, have mercy on me. Jesus, Savior of the world, grant me peace. And that's something I pray through the day. It keeps me humble. It helps me see others from a posture of grace and humility. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on me. Jesus, bearer of my sins, have mercy on me. Jesus, Savior of the world, grant me peace. Let me encourage you to approach the sins of others as a fellow sinner in need of grace and mercy because there are no good guys in God's economy. Everyone needs salvation. Everyone needs His mercy. Let me pray for us and the music team will lead us as we sing in response. Gracious God, we come to You. We come to You from a posture of humility this morning. 
we want to say alongside the tax collector, God have mercy on us. We need saving. We too are failed, guilty, broken sinners in need of grace. Come meet us in our fallenness. Humble us so that we might always respond to you with thanksgiving and to others around us who are just as broken in a posture of grace and mercy and humility. Amen.